of Newspeak. Newspeak is the official language of Oceania and has been devised... 1984 by George Orwell It was a bright cold day in April, and the clocks were striking thirteen. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At one end of it, a coloured poster, too large for indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a metre wide. The face of a man about forty-five, with a heavy black moustache and ruggedly handsome features. Winston made for the stairs. It was no use trying the lift. Even at the best of times it was seldom working, and at present the electric current was cut off during daylight hours. It was part of the economy drive in preparation for hate week. The flat was seven flights up, and Winston, who was thirty-nine and had a varicose ulcer above his right ankle, went slowly, resting several times on the way. On each landing opposite the lift shaft, the poster with the enormous face gazed from the wall. It was one of those pictures which are so contrived that the eyes follow you about when you move. Big Brother is watching you, the caption ran beneath it. Inside the flat, a voice was reading out a list of figures that had something to do with the production of pig iron. The voice came from an oblong metal plaque like a dulled mirror which formed part of the surface of the right-hand wall. Winston turned a switch and the voice sank somewhat though the words were still distinguishable. The instrument, the telescreen it was called, could be dimmed, but there was no way of shutting it off completely. He moved over to the window. A smallish, frail figure, the meagerness of his body merely emphasised by the blue overalls which were the uniform of the party. His hair was very fair, his face naturally sanguine, his skin roughened by coarse soap and blunt razor blades, and the cold of the winter that had just ended. Outside, even through the shut window pane, the world looked cold. Down in the street, little eddies of wind were whirling dust and torn paper into spirals. And though the sun was shining and the sky a harsh blue, there seemed to be no colour in anything, except the posters that were plastered everywhere. The black moustachioed face gazed down from every commanding corner. Big Brother is watching you, the caption said while the dark eyes looked deep into Winston's own. Behind Winston's back, the voice from the telescreen was still babbling away. The telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. Any sound that Winston made above the level of a very low whisper would be picked up by it. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision which the metal plaque commanded, he could be seen as well as heard. Winston kept his back turned to the telescreen. It was safer, though, as he well knew, even a back can be revealing. A kilometre away, the Ministry of Truth, his place of work, towered vast and white above the grimy landscape. This, he thought with a sort of vague distaste, this was London, chief city of Airstrip One, itself the third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. He tried to squeeze out some childhood memory that should tell him whether London had always been quite like this. Were there always these vistas of rotting nineteenth-century houses, their sides shored up with balks of timber, their windows patched with cardboard and their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions, and the bond sites where the plaster dust swirled in the air and the willow herbs straggled over the heaps of rubble and the places where the bomb had cleared a larger patch and there had sprung up sordid colonies of wooden dwellings like chicken houses. But it was no use. He could not remember. Nothing remained of his childhood except a series of bright-lit tableaus occurring against no background and mostly unintelligible. The Ministry of Truth was startlingly different from any other building inside. It was an enormous, pyramid-shaped structure of glittering white concrete, soaring up terrace after terrace, three hundred metres into the air. From where Winston stood, it was just possible to read, picked out on its white face in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party. War is peace. 
Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Scattered about London there were just three other buildings of similar appearance and size. They were the homes of the three other ministries. Apart from the Ministry of Truth, which concerned itself with news, there was the Ministry of Peace, which concerned itself with war, the Ministry of Love, which maintained law and order, and the Ministry of Plenty, which was responsible for economic affairs. Their names, in new speak, Mini True, Mini Pax, Mini Love, and Mini Plenty. The Ministry of Love was the really frightening one. It was a place impossible to enter except on official business, and then only by penetrating a maze of barbed wire entanglements, steel doors, and hidden machine gun nests. Even the streets leading up to its outer barriers were roamed by the gorilla faced guards in black uniforms, armed with jointed truncheons. Winston turned round abruptly. He had set his features into the expression of quiet optimism that is advisable to wear when facing the telescreen. He crossed the room into the tiny kitchen. He took down from a shelf a bottle of colourless liquid with a label marked Victory Gin. It gave off a sour, oily smell. Winston poured out nearly a teacupful and gulped it down like a dose of medicine. When the burning in his belly died down, the world began to look more cheerful. He took a cigarette from a pack marked Victory Cigarette and went back to the living room. For some reason the telescreen was in an unusual position in the room, and did not command a complete view. There was an alcove to the left of the screen with a small table in it. By sitting in the alcove, and keeping well back, Winston was able to keep outside the range of the telescreen. He could be heard, of course, but so long as he stayed in his chair he could not be seen. From the table drawer Winston took out a penholder, a bottle of ink, and a thick, quarto-sized blank book with a red back and a marble cover. It was a very beautiful book. He had seen it lying in the window of a frowsy little junk shop in a slummy quarter of town, and had been stricken immediately by an overwhelming desire to possess it. The party members were supposed not to go into ordinary shops, but the rule was not strictly kept, because there were various things, such as shoelaces and razor blades, which it was impossible to get hold of in any other way. He had bought it and carried it guiltily home in his briefcase. Even with nothing written in it, it was a compromising possession. The thing that he was about to do was to open a diary. This was not illegal. Nothing was illegal, since there were no longer any laws. But if detected, it was reasonably certain that it would be punished by death, or at least by twenty-five years in a forced labour camp. He dipped the pen in the ink, and then faltered for just a second. A tremor had gone through his bowels. To mark the paper was the decisive act. In small, clumsy letters he wrote, April the 4th, 1984. He sat back. A sense of complete helplessness had descended upon him. To begin with, he did not know with any certainty that the year was 1984. It must be around that date, since he was fairly sure that his age was 39, and he believed that he had been born in 1944 or 1945. But it was never possible nowadays to pin down any date within a year or two. For some time he sat staring stupidly at the paper. It was curious that he seemed not merely to have lost the part of expressing himself, but even to have forgotten what it was that he had originally intended to say. For weeks past he had been making ready for this moment, and it had never crossed his mind that anything would be needed except courage. All he had to do was to transfer to paper the interminable, restless monologue that had been running inside his head literally for years. At this moment, however, even the monologue had dried up. A memory began to clarify in his mind. It had happened this morning at the Ministry, if anything so nebulous can be said to happen. It was nearly eleven hundred, and in the records department where Winston worked, they were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the centre of the hall opposite the big telescreen, in preparation for the two minutes' hate. Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows 
when two people whom he knew by sight but had never spoken to came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl whom he had often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. Presumably, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying a spanner, she had some mechanical job on one of the novel-writing machines. She was a bold-looking girl of about twenty-seven, with thick hair, a freckled face, and swift athletic movements. A narrow scarlet sash, emblem of the junior anti-sex league, was wound several times round the waist of her overalls, just tightly enough to bring out the shapeliness of her hips. Winston had disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He disliked nearly all women, especially the young and pretty ones. It was always the pretty ones that were the most bigoted adherents to the party, the swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies, and the nosers out of unorthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of being more dangerous than most. The idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the thought police. The other person was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party and holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. A momentary hush passed over the group of people round the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large, burly man with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. In spite of his formidable appearance, he had a certain charm of manner. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen times in as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps merely a hope, that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it irresistibly. At any rate, he had the appearance of being a person you could talk to if somehow you could cheat the telescreens and get him alone. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify this guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment, O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw that it was nearly eleven hundred, and evidently decided to stay in the records department until the two minutes' hate was over. He took a chair in the same row as Winston, a couple of places away. The girl with dark hair was sitting immediately behind. The next moment... A hideous, grinding screech as of some monstrous machine running without oil burst from the big telescreen. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed onto the screen. Goldstein was the renegade and backslider who once, long ago, how long ago nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death, and had mysteriously escaped and disappeared. The programs of the two minutes' hate varied from day to day, but there was none in which Goldstein was not the principal figure. He was the primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party sprang directly out of his teaching. Somewhere or other he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies. Before they were thirty seconds into the hate, uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. He was an object of hatred more constant than either Eurasia or East Asia, since when Oceana was at war with one of these powers, it was generally at peace with the other. But what was strange was that, although Goldstein was hated and despised by everybody, in spite of all this, his influence never seemed to grow less. Always there were fresh dupes waiting to be seduced by him. A day never passed when spies and saboteurs acting under his directions were not unmasked by the thought police. He was the commander of a vast shadowy army, an underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of the state. The Brotherhood, its name was supposed to be. There were also whispered stories of a terrible book, a compendium of all the heresies of which Goldstein was the author, and which circulated clandestinely here and there. People referred to it, if at all, simply as the book. The dark-haired girl behind Winston had been crying out, Swine! Swine! And suddenly she picked up a heavy newspeak dictionary and flung it at the screen. It struck Goldstein's nose and bounced off. 
The voice continued inexorably. Winston found he was shouting with the others and kicking his heel violently against the rung of his chair. At this moment the entire group of people broke into a deep, slow, rhythmical chant of B, 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 over and over again. Winston's entrails seemed to grow cold. In the two minutes' hate he could not help sharing in the general delirium, but this subhuman chanting of B, 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 B always filled him with horror. To dissemble your feelings and do what everyone else was doing was an instinctive reaction. But there was the space of a couple of seconds when the expression of his eyes might conceivably have betrayed him. And it was exactly at this moment that the significant thing happened. If, indeed, it did happen. Momentarily, he caught O'Brien's eye. O'Brien had stood up. There was a fraction of a second when their eyes met. And for as long as it took to happen, Winston knew, yes, he knew, that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. An unmistakable message had passed. I am with you, O'Brien seemed to be saying to him. And then the flash of intelligence was gone, and O'Brien's face was as inscrutable as everyone else's. That was all, and he was already uncertain whether it had happened. Winston roused himself and sat up straighter at his little table. His eyes refocused on the page. He discovered that while he sat musing it had also been writing, printing in large, neat capitals, Down with Big Brother. Down with Big Brother. Down with Big Brother. Over and over again filling half a page. He could not help feeling a tug of panic. Thought crime, they called it. Thought crime was not a thing that could be concealed. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years, but sooner or later the thought police were bound to get you. For a moment he was seized by a kind of hysteria. He began writing in a hurried, untidy school. They'll shoot me. I don't care. They'll shoot me in the back of the neck. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. They always shoot you in the back of the neck. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. He sat back in his chair, slightly ashamed of himself, and laid down the pen. The next moment he started violently. There was a knocking at the door. Already? He sat still as a mouse, in the futile hope that whoever it was might go away at a single attempt. But no, the knocking was repeated. The worst thing of all would be to delay. His heart was thumping like a drum. But his face, from long habit, was probably expressionless. He got up and moved heavily towards the door. As he put his hand to the doorknob, Winston saw that he had left the diary open on the table. Down with Big Brother was written all over it in letters almost big enough to be legible across the room. It was an inconceivably stupid thing to have done. He drew in his breath and opened the door. Instantly a warm wave of relief flowed through him. A colourless, crushed-looking woman with wispy hair and a lined face was standing outside. It was the wife of his neighbour on the same floor. Oh, comrade, she began in a dreary, whining sort of voice, do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up, and... When Winston was back in his own flat, he stepped quickly past the telly screen and sat down at the table again. He picked up his pen, half-heartedly, wondering whether he could find something more to write in his diary. Suddenly the telly screen struck fourteen. He must leave in ten minutes. He had to be back at work by fourteen-thirty. Curiously, the chiming of the hour seemed to have put new heart in him. He was a lonely ghost uttering a truth nobody would ever hear. But so long as he uttered it, in some obscure way the continuity was not broken. It was not by making yourself heard, but by staying sane that you carried on the human heritage. He dipped his pen in the ink and wrote, To the future or to the past, to a time 
when thought is free, when men are different from one another and do not live alone, to a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone, from the age of uniformity, from the age of solitude, from the age of big brother, from the age of double think, greetings. He was already dead, he reflected. It seemed to him that it was only now, when he had begun to be able to formulate his thoughts, that he had taken the decisive step. The consequences of every act are included in the act itself. He wrote, Thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. Now he had recognized himself as a dead man. It became important to stay alive as long as possible. Two fingers of his right hand were ink-stained. It was exactly the kind of detail that might betray you. Some nosing zealot of the ministry, a woman probably, someone like the dark-haired girl from the fiction department, might start wondering why he had been writing during the lunch interval, why he had used an old-fashioned pen, what had he been writing, and then drop a hint in the appropriate quarter. He went to the bathroom and carefully scrubbed the ink away with the gritty, dark-brown soap which rasped your skin like sandpaper, and was therefore well adapted for this purpose. He put the diary away in the drawer. It was quite useless to think of hiding it, but he could at least make sure whether or not its existence had been discovered. A hair laid across the page ends was too obvious. With the tip of his finger, he picked up an identifiable grain of whitish dust and deposited it on the corner of the cover, but it was bound to be shaken off if the book was moved. Winston was dreaming. Suddenly he was standing on short, springy turf, on a summer evening when the slanting rays of the sun gilded the ground. The landscape that he was looking at recurred so often in his dreams that he was never fully certain whether or not he had seen it in the real world. In his waking thoughts he called it the Golden Country. It was an old, rabbit-bitten pasture with a foot-track wandering across it and a molehill here and there. In the ragged hedge on the opposite side of the field the boughs of the elm trees were swaying very faintly in the breeze, their leaves just stirring in dense masses like women's hair. Somewhere near at hand, though out of sight, there was a clear, slow-moving stream where dace were swimming in the pools under the willow trees. The girl with dark hair was coming towards them across the field. With what seemed a single movement she tore off her clothes and flung them disdainfully aside. Her body was white and smooth, but it aroused no desire in him. Indeed, he barely looked at it. What overwhelmed him in that instant was admiration for the gesture with which she had thrown her clothes aside. With its grace and carelessness it seemed to annihilate a whole culture, a whole system of thought, as though Big Brother and the Party and the Thought Police could all be swept into nothingness by a single, splendid movement of the arm. That, too, was a gesture belonging to the ancient time. Winston woke up with the word Shakespeare on his lips. With the deep, unconscious sigh which not even the nearness of the telescreen could prevent him from uttering when his day's work started, Winston pulled the speakwright towards him blew the dust from its mouthpiece, and put on his spectacles. Then he unrolled and clipped together four small cylinders of paper, which had already flopped out of the pneumatic tube on the right-hand side of his desk. In the walls of the cubicle there were three orifices. To the right of the speakwright, a small pneumatic tube for written messages. To the left, a larger one for newspapers. And in the side wall, within easy reach of Winston's arm, a large oblong slit protected by a wire grating. This last was for the disposal of waste paper. Similar slits existed in thousands or tens of thousands throughout the building, not only in every room, but at short intervals in every corridor. For some reason, they were nicknamed memory holes. When one knew that any document was due for destruction, or even when one saw a scrap of waste paper lying about, it was an automatic action to lift the flap of the nearest memory hole and drop it in whereupon it will be whirled away on a current of warm air 
the enormous furnaces which were hidden somewhere in the recesses of the building. Winston dialed back numbers on the terrace screen and called for the appropriate issues of the Times, which slid out of the pneumatic tube only after a few minutes' delay. The messages he had received referred to articles or news items which, for one reason or another, it was thought necessary to alter, or, as the official phrase had it, to rectify. As soon as Winston had dealt with each of the messages, he clipped his speak-written corrections to the appropriate copy of the Times and pushed them into the pneumatic tube. Then, with a movement which was as nearly as possible unconscious, he crumpled up the original message and any notes that he himself had made and dropped them into the memory hole to be devoured by the flames. What happened in the unseen labyrinth to which the pneumatic tubes led, he did not know in detail. But he did know in general terms. As soon as all the corrections which happened to be necessary in any particular number of the times had been assembled and collated, that number would be reprinted, the original copy destroyed, and the corrected copy placed on the files in its stead. A number of the times which might, because of changes in political alignment or mistaken prophecies uttered by Big Brother, have been rewritten a dozen times, still stood on the files bearing its original date, and no other copy existed to contradict it. Books also were recalled and rewritten again and again, and were invariably reissued without any admission that any alteration had been made. And the records department was itself only a single branch of the Ministry of Truth, and the Ministry had not only to supply the multifarious needs of the party, but also to repeat the whole operation at a lower level for the benefit of the proletariat. There was a whole chain of separate departments dealing with proletarian literature, music, drama, and entertainment generally. Here were produced rubbishy newspapers, containing almost nothing except sport, crime, and astrology, sensational five-cent novelettes, films oozing with sex, and sentimental songs which were composed entirely by mechanical means, on a special kind of kaleidoscope known as a versificator. There was even a whole subsection, porno sec, it was called in Newspeak, engaged in producing the lowest kind of pornography, which was sent out in sealed packets and which no party member, other than those who worked on it, was permitted to look at. If there is hope, wrote Winston, it lies in the proles. If there was hope, it must lie in the proles because only there, in those swarming, disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania, could the force to destroy the party ever be generated. The party could not be overthrown from within. Its enemies, if it had any enemies, had no way of coming together, or even of identifying one another. Even if the legendary brotherhood existed, as just possibly it might, it was inconceivable that its members could ever assemble in large numbers. But the proles, if only they could somehow become conscious of their strength, would have no need to conspire. Surely, sooner or later, it must occur to them to do it. And yet, he wrote, Until they become conscious, they will never rebel and until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. That, he reflected, might almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. It might be true that the average human being was better off now than he had been before the revolution. The only evidence to the contrary was the mute protest in your own bones, the instinctive feeling that the conditions you lived in were intolerable, and that at some other time they must have been different. It struck him that the truly characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty and insecurity, but simply its bareness, its dinginess, its listlessness. Life, if you looked about you, bore no resemblance not only to the lies that streamed out of the telescreens, but even to the ideals that the party were trying to achieve. Great areas of it, even for a party member, were neutral and non-political, a matter of slogging through dreary jobs, fighting for a place on the tube, darning a worn-out sock, catching a saccharine tablet, saving a cigarette end. The ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible, and glittering, 
a world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons, a nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working, fighting, triumphing, persecuting, three hundred million people, all with the same face. The reality was decaying, dingy cities, where underfed people shuffled to and fro in leaky shoes, in patched-up nineteenth-century houses that smelt always of cabbage and bad lavatories. He seemed to see a vision of London, vast and ruinous, a city of a million dustbins. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how. I do not understand why. He wondered, as he had many times wondered before, whether he himself was a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. But the thought of being a lunatic did not greatly trouble him. The horror was that he might also be wrong. With the feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien, and also that he was setting forth an important axiom, he wrote, Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. From somewhere at the bottom of a passage, the smell of roasting coffee, real coffee, not victory coffee, came floating out into the street. Winston paused involuntarily. For perhaps two seconds he was back in the half-forgotten world of his childhood. Then a door banged, seeming to cut off the smell as abruptly as though it had been a sound. He had walked several kilometres over pavements, and his varicose ulcer was throbbing. This was the second time in three weeks that he had missed an evening in the community centre. A rash act, since you could be certain that the number of your attendances at the centre was carefully checked. But this evening, as he came out of the ministry, the bar menace of the April air had tempted him. On impulse, he had turned away from his bus stop and wandered off into the labyrinth of London, first south, then east, then north again, losing himself among unknown streets and hardly bothering in which direction he was going. He was in a narrow street with a few dark little shops interspersed among dwelling houses. Immediately above his head, there hung three discoloured metal balls, which looked as if they had once been gilded. He seemed to know the place. Of course. He was standing outside the junk shop where he had bought the diary. A twinge of fear went through him. It had been a sufficiently rash act to buy the book in the beginning, and he had sworn never to come near the place again. And yet the instant that he allowed his thoughts to wander... His feet had brought him back here of their own accord. It was precisely against suicidal impulses of this kind that he had hoped to guard himself by opening the diary. The shop was still open. With the feeling that he would be less conspicuous inside than hanging about on the pavement, he stepped through the doorway. If questioned, he could plausibly say that he was trying to buy razor blades. The old proprietor had just lighted a hanging oil lamp, which gave off an unclean but friendly smell. "'I recognised you on the pavement,' he said immediately. "'Is there anything special I can do for you, or did you just want to look round?' "'I was passing,' said Winston vaguely. "'I just looked in.' The tiny interior of the shop was uncomfortably full, but there was almost nothing in it of the slightest value. The floor space was very restricted, because all round the walls were stacked innumerable dusty picture frames. In the window there were trays of nuts and bolts, worn-out chisels, penknives with broken blades, tarnished watches that did not even pretend to be in going order, and other miscellaneous rubbish. Only on a small table in the corner was there a litter of odds and ends, lacquered snuff-boxes, agate brooches and the like which looked as though they might include something interesting. As Winston wandered over towards the table, 
is I was caught by a round, smooth thing that gleamed softly in the lamplight, and he picked it up. It was a heavy lump of glass, curved on one side, flat on the other, making almost a hemisphere. There was a peculiar softness as of rainwater in both the colour and the texture of the glass. At the heart of it, magnified by the curved surface, there was a strange pink convoluted object that recalled a rose or a sea anemone. "'What is it?' said Winston, fascinated. Oh, "'That's coral, that is,' said the old man. "'It must have come from the Indian Ocean. They used to kind of embed it in the glass. That wasn't made less than a hundred years ago. More, by the look of it.' "'It's a beautiful thing,' said Winston. "'It is a beautiful thing,' said the other, appreciatively. But there's not many that would say so nowadays. He coughed. <laughs> now, if it so happened that you wanted to buy it, that would cost you four dollars. Winston immediately paid over the money and slid the coveted thing into his pocket. What appealed to him about it was not so much its beauty as the air it seemed to possess of belonging to an age quite different from the present one. It was very heavy in his pocket, but fortunately it did not make much of a bulge. It was a queer thing, even a compromising thing, for a party member to have in his possession. Anything old, and for that matter anything beautiful, was always vaguely suspect. The old man had grown noticeably more cheerful after receiving the four dollars. "'There's another room upstairs that you might care to uh, look at,' uh, he said. "'There's not much in it, just a few pieces.' He lit another lamp, and with bowed back led the way slowly up the steep and worn stairs and along a tiny passage, into a room which did not give on to the street but looked out on a cobbled yard and a forest of chimney-pots. Winston noticed that the furniture was still arranged as though the room was meant to be lived in. There was a strip of carpet on the floor, a picture or two on the walls, and a deep, slatternly armchair drawn up to the fireplace. An old-fashioned glass clock with a twelve-hour face, was ticking away on the mantelpiece. Under the window and occupying nearly a quarter of the room was an enormous bed with a mattress still on it. "'We lived here till my wife died,' said the old man, half apologetically. "'I'm selling the furniture off little by little. Now that's a beautiful mahogany bed, or at least it would be if you could get the bugs out of it. But I dare say you'd find it a little bit cumbersome.' He was holding the lamp high up so as to illuminate the whole room, and in the warm, dim light the place looked curiously inviting. The thought flitted through Winston's mind that it would probably be quite easy to rent the room for a few dollars a week, if he dared to take the risk. It was a wild, impossible notion, to be abandoned as soon as thought of. But the room had awakened in him a sort of nostalgia, a sort of ancestral memory, it seemed to him that he knew exactly what it felt like to sit in a room like this, in an armchair beside an open fire, with your feet in the fender, and a kettle on the hob. Utterly alone, utterly secure, with nobody watching you, no voice pursuing you, no sound except the singing of the kettle and the friendly ticking of the clock. There's no telescreen, he could not help murmuring. Oh, said the old man. I never had one of those things, too expensive, and I never seemed to feel the need of it somehow. Winston lingered for some minutes more, talking to the old man, whose name, he discovered, was Charrington. Mr. Charrington, it seemed, was a widower, aged sixty-three, and had inhabited this shop for thirty years. He got away from Mr. Charrington and went down the stairs alone so as not to let the old man see him reconnoitering the street before stepping out of the door. Suddenly his heart seemed to turn to ice and his bowels to water. A figure in blue overalls was coming down the pavement not ten metres away. It was the girl from the fiction department, the girl with the dark hair. The light was falling, but there was no difficulty in recognising her. She looked him straight in the face, then walked quickly on as though she had not seen him. For a few seconds Winston was too paralysed to move. Then he turned to the right and walked heavily away, not noticing for the moment that he was going in the wrong direction. 
At any rate, one question was settled. There was no doubting any longer that the girl was spying on him. It was after twenty-two hours when he got back to the flat. The lights would be switched off at the main at twenty-three thirty. He went into the kitchen and swallowed nearly a teacupful of victory gin. Then he went to the table in the alcove, sat down, and took the diary out of the drawer. It was important to write something down. He tried to think of O'Brien, for whom, or to whom, the diary was written. But instead he began thinking of the things that would happen to him after the thought police took him away. It would not matter if they killed you at once. To be killed was what you expected. But before death, nobody spoke of such things, yet everybody knew of them. There was the routine of confession that had to be gone through. The groveling on the floor and screaming for mercy. The crack of broken bones, the smashed teeth, the bloody clots of hair. Why did you have to endure it, since the end was always the same? Why was it not possible to cut a few days or weeks out of your life? Nobody ever escaped detection, and nobody ever failed to confess. When once you had succumbed to thought crime, it was certain that by a given date you would be dead. Why, then, did that horror, which altered nothing, have to lie embedded in future time? He tried, with a little more success than before, to summon up the image of O'Brien. But with the voice from the telescreen and nagging at his ears, he could not follow the train of thought further. He put a cigarette in his mouth. Half the tobacco promptly fell out onto his tongue, a bitter dust which was difficult to spit out again. The face of Big Brother swam into his mind, displacing that of O'Brien, and as he had done a few days earlier, he slid a coin out of his pocket and looked at it. The face gazed up at him, heavy, calm, protecting. But what kind of smile was hidden beneath the dark moustache? Like a leaden knell, the words came back at him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. It was the middle of the morning, and Winston had left the cubicle to go to the lavatory. A solitary figure was coming towards him from the other end of the long, brightly lit corridor. It was the girl with dark hair. Four days had gone past since the evening when he had run into her outside the junk shop. They were perhaps four metres apart, when the girl stumbled and fell almost flat on her face. A sharp cry of pain was wrung out of her. Winston stopped short. Her eyes were fixed on his with an appealing expression that looked more like fear than pain. "'You're hurt?' he said. Oh, yes, "'It's nothing. Um, I'll be all right in a second. She spoke as though her heart were fluttering. She had certainly turned very pale. "'You haven't broken anything?' "'No, I'm all right. It hurt for a moment, that's all.' She held out her hand to him, and he helped her up. She had regained some of her colour, and appeared very much better. "'It's nothing,' she repeated shortly. "'Thanks, comrade.' And with that she walked on in the direction in which she had been going as briskly as though it had really been nothing. The whole incident could not have taken as much as half a minute. Nevertheless, in the two or three seconds while he was helping her up, the girl had slipped something into his hand. There was no question that she had done it intentionally. It was something small and flat. As he passed through the lavatory door, he transferred it to his pocket and felt it with the tips of his fingers. It was a scrap of paper, folded into a square. He went back to his cubicle, sat down, threw the fragment of paper casually among the other papers on the desk. He readjusted his spectacles on his nose, sighed, and drew the batch of work towards him with the scrap of paper on top of it. He flattened it out. On it was written, in a large, unformed handwriting, I love you. For several seconds, he was too stunned even to throw the incriminating thing into the memory hole. When he did so, although he very well knew the danger of showing too much interest, he could not resist reading it once again, just to make sure that the words were really there. For a week after this, life was like a restless dream. 
His whole mind and body seemed to be afflicted with an unbearable sensitivity, a sort of transparency which made every movement, every sound, every contact, every word that he had to speak or listen to, an agony. Even in sleep he could not altogether escape from her image. He did not touch the diary during those days. If there was any relief, it was in his work, in which he could sometimes forget himself for ten minutes at a stretch. At the end of the week they managed, by good luck, to sit at the same table in the canteen. With thundering heart, Winston did not look at her. He unpacked his tray and promptly began eating. A week had gone by since she had first approached him. She would have changed her mind. She must have changed her mind. Her cheek was almost near enough for him to feel its warmth. She began speaking in an, an expressionless voice, with lips barely moving, a mere murmur easily drowned by the dinner voices. "'Can you get Sunday afternoon off?' "'Yes.' "'Then listen carefully. You'll have to remember this. Go to Paddington Station.' With a sort of military precision that astonished him, she outlined the route that he was to follow. "'Can you remember all that?' she murmured finally. Yes. You turn left, then right, then left again. And the gate's got no top bar. Yes. Uh, what time? About fifteen. You may have to wait. I'll get there by another way. Are you sure you remember everything? Yes. Winston picked his way up the lane through dappled light and shade, stepping out into pools of gold wherever the boughs parted. Under the trees to the left of him the ground was misty with bluebells. The air seemed to kiss one's skin. It was the second of May. From somewhere deeper in the heart of the wood came the droning of ring doves. He was a bit early. There had been no difficulties about the journey, and the girl was so evidently experienced that he was less frightened than he would normally have been. Presumably she could be trusted to find a safe place. In general, you could not assume that you were much safer in the country than in London. For distances of less than one hundred kilometres, it was not necessary to get your passport endorsed. But sometimes there were patrols hanging about the railway stations, who examined the papers of any party member they found there, and asked awkward questions. However, no patrols had appeared, and on the walk from the station he had made sure by cautious backward glances that he was not being followed. The lane widened and in a minute he came to the footpath she had told him of, a mere cattle track which plunged between the bushes. He had no watch, but it could not be fifteen yet. The bluebells were so thick underfoot that it was impossible not to tread on them. He knelt down and began picking some, partly to pass the time away, but also from a vague idea that he would like to have a bunch of flowers to offer to the girl when they met. He had gone together a big bunch and was smelling their faint, sickly scent, when a sound at his back froze him, the unmistakable crackle of a foot on twigs. He went on, picking bluebells. It was the best thing to do. It might be the girl, or he might have been followed after all. To look round was to show guilt. He picked another. And another. A hand fell lightly on his shoulder. He looked up. It was the girl. She led the way along the narrow track into the wood. They came to a natural clearing, a tiny grassy knoll, surrounded by tall saplings that shut it in completely. The girl stopped and turned. Here we are, she said. He was facing her at several paces' distance, and yet he did not dare move nearer to her, I didn't want to say anything in the lane, she went on, in case there's a mic hidden there. We're all right here. The next moment, it was hard to say by whose act, she was in his arms. At the beginning he had no feeling except sheer incredulity. The youthful body was strained against his own. The mass of dark hair was against his face. And, yes... Actually, she had turned her face up, and he was kissing the wide red mouth. She had clasped her arms about his neck. She was calling him darling, precious one, loved one. 
What is your name? asked Winston. Julia. I know yours. It's Winston. Winston Smith. How did you find that out? I expect I'm better at finding things out than you are, dear. Tell me, what did you think of me before that day I gave you the note? He did not feel any temptation to tell lies to her. It was even a sort of love offering to start off by telling the worst. I hated the sight of you, he said. The girl laughed delightedly, evidently taking this as a tribute to the excellence of her disguise. You are very young, he said. You are ten or fifteen years younger than I am. What could you see to attract you in a man like me? It was something in your face. I thought I'd take a chance. I'm good at spotting people who don't belong. As soon as I saw you, I knew you were against them. Them, it appeared, meant the party, and above all, the inner party, about whom she talked with an open, jeering hatred which made Winston feel uneasy, although he knew that they were safe here if they could be safe anywhere. A thing that astonished him about her was the coarseness of her language. Party members were supposed not to swear, and Winston himself very seldom did swear, aloud at any rate. Julia, however, seemed unable to mention the party, and especially the inner party, without using the kind of words that you saw chalked up in dripping alleyways. He did not dislike it. It was merely one symptom of her revolt against the party and all its ways, and somehow it seemed natural and healthy, like the sneeze of a horse that smells bad hay. They left the clearing and wandered again through the checkered shade, with their arms round each other's waists whenever it was wide enough to walk two abreast. They stood in the shade of hazel bushes. The sunlight, filtering through innumerable leaves, was still hot on their faces. Winston looked out into the field beyond and underwent a curious, slow shock of recognition. He knew it by sight. "'Isn't there a stream somewhere near here?' he whispered. "'That's right. There is a stream. It's at the edge of the next field.' "'It's the golden country, almost,' he murmured. "'The golden country?' Oh, "'It's nothing, really. A landscape I've seen sometimes in a dream.' There was a direct, intimate connection between chastity and political orthodoxy. For how could the fear, the hatred, and the lunatic credulity which the party needed in its members be kept at the right pitch, except by bottling down some powerful instinct and using it as a driving force? The sex impulse was dangerous to the party, and the party had turned it to account. From the moment of declaring war on the party, it was better to think of yourself as a corpse. We are dead, he said. We're not dead yet, said Julia prosaically. Not physically. Six months, a year, five years, conceivably. I'm afraid of death. You are young, so presumably you're more afraid of it than I am. Obviously we shall put it off as long as we can, but it makes very little difference. So long as human beings stay human, death and life are the same thing. Oh, rubbish! Which would you sooner sleep with, me or a skeleton? Don't you enjoy being alive? Don't you like feeling? This is me. This is my hand. This is my leg. I'm real. I'm solid. I'm alive. Don't you like this? She twisted herself round and pressed her bosom against him. He could feel her breasts, ripe yet firm through her overalls. Her body seemed to be pouring some of its youth and vigour into his. Yes. I like that, he said. Then stop talking about dying. Winston looked round the shabby little room above Mr. Charrington's shop. Beside the window, the enormous bed was made up, with ragged blankets and a coverless bolster. The old-fashioned clock with a twelve-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. In the fender was a battered tin oil stove a saucepan, and two cups provided by Mr. Charrington. Winston lit the burner and set a pan of water to boil, 
he had brought an envelope full of victory coffee and some saccharine tablets. The clock's hands said 7.20. It was 19.20, really. She was coming at 19.30. Folly. Folly, his heart kept saying. Conscious, gratuitous, suicide, or folly. Of all the crimes that a party member could commit, this one was the least possible to conceal. As he had foreseen, Mr. Charrington had made no difficulty about letting the room. Nor did he seem shocked or become offensively knowing when it was made clear that Winston wanted the room for the purpose of a love affair. Privacy, he said, was a very valuable thing. Under the window, somebody was singing. Winston peeped out, secure in the protection of the muslin curtain. The June sun was still high in the sky, and in the sun-filled court below, a monstrous woman, solid as a Norman pillar, with brawny red forearms and a sacking apron strapped about her middle, was stumping to and fro between a washtub and a clothesline, pegging out a series of square white things which Winston recognised as baby's diapers. Whenever her mouth was not corked with clothes pegs, she was singing in a powerful contralto. It was only an hopeless fancy, it passed like an April day, but I look in a word in the dreams they stirred, they have stolen my heart away. The tune had been haunting London for weeks past. It was one of countless similar songs published for the benefit of the proles by a subsection of the music department. The words of these songs were composed without any human intervention whatever on an instrument known as a versificator. But the woman sang so tunefully as to turn the dreadful rubbish into an almost pleasant sound. At this moment there was a quick step on the stairs. Julia burst into the room. She was carrying a tool bag of coarse brown canvas, such as he had sometimes seen her carrying to and fro at the ministry. He started forward to take her in his arms, but she disengaged herself rather hurriedly, partly because she was still holding the tool bag. Uh, half a second, she said. Just let me show you what I've brought. Did you bring some of that filthy victory coffee? I thought you would. You can chuck it away again, because we shan't be needing it. Look here. She fell on her knees, threw open the bag, and tumbled out some spanners and a screwdriver that filled the top part of it. Underneath were a number of neat paper packets. Real sugar. Not saccharin. Sugar. And here's a loaf of bread. Proper white bread. Not our bloody stuff. And a little pot of jam. And here's a tin of milk. But look, this is the one I'm really proud of. I had to wrap a bit of sacking round it because... But she did not need to tell him why she had wrapped it up. The smell was already filling the room. A rich, hot smell like an emanation from his early childhood. It's coffee, he murmured. Real coffee. They flung their clothes off and climbed into the huge mahogany bed. It's sure to be full of bugs, but who cares, said Julia. One never saw a double bed nowadays, except in the homes of the proles. Winston had occasionally slept in one in his boyhood. Julia had never been in one before, so far as she could remember. Presently they fell asleep for a little while. When Winston woke up, the hands of the clock had crept round to nearly nine. He did not stir, because Julia was sleeping with her head in the crook of his arm. He wondered vaguely whether, in the abolished past, it had been a normal experience to lie in a bed like this, in the cool of a summer evening, a man and a woman with no clothes on, making love when they chose, talking of what they chose, not feeling any compulsion to get up, simply lying there and listening to peaceful sounds outside. Surely there could never have been a time when that seemed ordinary. Julia woke up, rubbed her eyes, and raised herself on an elbow to look at the oil stove. Half the water's boiled away, she said. I'll get up and make some coffee in another moment. Hi! Get out, you filthy brute! She suddenly twisted herself over in the bed, seized a shoe from the floor, and sent it hurtling into the corner with a boyish jerk of her arm, exactly as he had seen her fling the dictionary at Goldstein that morning during the two minutes eight. What was it? he said in surprise. A rat! There's a hole down there! 
rats! exclaimed Winston. In this room? They're all over the place, said Julia indifferently as she lay down again. Don't go on, said Winston, with his eyes tightly shut. Dearest, you've gone quite pale. What's the matter? Do they make you feel sick? Of all horrors in the world, a rat. For several moments he had the feeling of being back in a nightmare which had recurred from time to time throughout his life. He was standing in front of a wall of darkness, and on the other side of it there was something unendurable, something too dreadful to be faced. In the dream his deepest feeling was always one of self-deception, because he did in fact know what was behind the wall of darkness. I'm sorry, he said. It's nothing. I don't like rats, that's all. Already the black instant of panic was half forgotten. Feeling slightly ashamed of himself, he sat up against the bedhead. Julia got out of bed, pulled on her overalls, and made the coffee. Winston did not get up for a few minutes more. The room was darkening. He turned over towards the light and lay gazing into the glass paperweight. He had the feeling that he could get inside it. The paperweight was the room he was in, and the coral was Julia's life and his own, fixed in a sort of eternity at the heart of the crystal. The weather was baking hot. In the labyrinthine ministry the windowless, air-conditioned rooms kept their normal temperature, but outside the pavement scorched one's feet and the stench of the tubes at the rush hours was a horror. The preparations for hate week were in full swing, and the staffs of all the ministries were working overtime. Processions, meetings, military parades, lectures, waxworks, displays, film shows, telescreen programs all had to be organized. Stands had to be erected, effigies built, slogans coined, songs written, rumors circulated, photographs faked. Julia's unit in the fiction department had been taken off the production of novels and was rushing out a series of atrocity pamphlets. Winston, in addition to his regular work, spent long periods every day in going through backfiles of the Times and altering and embellishing news items which were to be quoted in speeches. In the room over Mr. Challington's shop, when they could get there, Julia and Winston lay side by side on a stripped bed under the open window, naked for the sake of coolness. The rat had never come back, but the bugs had multiplied hideously in the heat. It did not seem to matter. Dirty or clean, the room was paradise. As soon as they arrived, they would sprinkle everything with pepper, bought on the black market, tear off their clothes, and make love with sweating bodies, then fall asleep and wake to find that the bugs had rallied and were massing for the counter-attack. Four, five... Six, seven times they met during the month of June. Winston had dropped his habit of drinking gin at all hours. He seemed to have lost the need for it. He'd grown fatter, his varicose ulcer had subsided, leaving only a brown stain on the skin above his ankle. His fits of coughing in the early morning had stopped. The process of life had ceased to be intolerable. He had no longer any impulse to make faces at the telescreen or shout curses at the top of his voice. Now that they had a secure hiding place, almost a home, it did not even seem a hardship that they could only meet infrequently and for a couple of hours at a time. What mattered was that the room over the junk shop should exist. To know that it was there, inviolate, was almost the same as being in it. Often they gave themselves up to daydreams of escape. Their luck would hold indefinitely, and they would carry on their intrigue just like this for the remainder of their natural lives. Or they would commit suicide together. Or they would disappear, alter themselves out of recognition, learn to speak with proletarian accents, get jobs in a factory, and live out their lives undetected in a back street. It was all nonsense, as they both knew. In reality, there was no escape. Even the one plan that was practicable, suicide, they had no intention of carrying out. To hang on from day to day and from week to week, 
spinning out a present that had no future, seemed an unconquerable instinct, just as one's lungs will always draw the next breath so long as there is air available. Sometimes, too, they talked of engaging in active rebellion against the party, but with no notion of how to take the first step. Even if the fabulous brotherhood was a reality, there still remained the difficulty of finding one's way into it. He told her of the strange intimacy that existed, or seemed to exist, between himself and O'Brien, and of the impulse he sometimes felt simply to walk into O'Brien's presence, announce that he was the enemy of the party, and demand his help. Curiously enough, this did not strike her as an impossibly rash thing to do. She was used to judging people by their faces, and it seemed natural to her that Winston should believe O'Brien to be trustworthy on the strength of a single flash of the eyes. In some ways she was far more acute than Winston, and far less susceptible to party propaganda. Only when he happened in some connection to mention the war against Eurasia, she startled him by saying casually that in her opinion the war was not happening. The rocket bombs, which fell daily on London, were probably fired by the government of Oceania itself, just to keep people frightened. This was an idea that had literally never occurred to him. Then one day it happened. All his life, it seemed to him, he had been waiting for it to happen. He was walking down the long corridor at the ministry, and he was almost at the spot where Julia had slipped the note into his hand, when he became aware that someone larger than himself was walking just behind him. The person, whoever it was, gave a small cough, evidently as a prelude to speaking. Winston stopped abruptly and turned. It was O'Brien. At last they were face to face, and it seemed that his only impulse was to run away. His heart bounded violently. He would have been incapable of speaking. O'Brien, however, had continued forward in the same movement, laying a friendly hand for a moment on Winston's arm, so that the two of them were walking side by side. He began speaking with the peculiar grave courtesy that differentiated him from the majority of inner party members. I had been hoping for an opportunity of talking to you, he said. I was reading one of your newspeak articles in the Times the other day. You take a scholarly interest in newspeak, I believe. Uh, hardly scholarly, he said. I'm, I'm only an amateur. What I had really intended to say was, have you seen the tenth edition of the Newspeak Dictionary? Uh, no, said Winston. I didn't think it had been issued yet. We're still using the ninth in the records department. The tenth edition is not due to appear for some months, I believe, but a few advanced copies have been circulated. I have one myself. It might interest you to look at it, perhaps. Very much so, said Winston, immediately seeing where this tended. Perhaps you could pick it up at my flat at some time that suited you. Uh, wait, let me give you my address. They were standing in front of a telescreen. Somewhat absent-mindedly, O'Brien felt two of his pockets and then produced a small leather-coloured notebook and a gold ink pencil. Immediately beneath the telescreen, in such a position that anyone who was watching at the other end of the instrument could read what he was writing, he scribbled an address, tore out the page, and handed it to Winston. "'I am usually at home in the evenings,' he said. "'If not, my servant will give you the dictionary.' He was gone leaving Winston holding the scrap of paper, which this time there was no need to conceal. He had the sensation of stepping into the dampness of a grave, and it was not much better because he had always known that the grave was there and waiting for him. Winston's heart was thumping so hard that he doubted whether he would be able to speak. They had done it. They had done it at last, was all he could think. It had been a rash act to come here at all, and sheer folly to arrive together. But merely to walk into such a place needed an effort of the nerve. It was only on very rare occasions that one saw inside the dwelling places of the inner party, or even penetrated into the quarter of the town where they lived. 
The whole atmosphere, the huge block of flats, the richness and spaciousness of everything, the unfamiliar smells of good food and good tobacco, the silent and incredibly rapid lift sliding up and down, the servants hurrying to and fro. Everything was intimidating. When the servants showed them in, O'Brien rose deliberately from his chair and came towards them across the soundless carpet. As O'Brien passed the telly screen, a thought seemed to strike him. He stopped, turned aside, and pressed a switch on the wall. There was a sharp snap. The voice had stopped. Julia uttered a tiny sound, a sort of squeak of surprise. Even in the midst of his panic, Winston was too much taken aback to be able to hold his tongue. Y you can turn it off, he said. Yes, said O'Brien. We can turn it off. We have that privilege. He was opposite them now. His solid form towered over the pair of them, and the expression on his face was still indecipherable. He was waiting, somewhat sternly, for Winston to speak. But about what? The seconds marched past, enormous. With difficulty, Winston continued to keep his eyes fixed on O'Brien. Then he began. We have come here because... He paused, realizing for the first time the vagueness of his own motives. Because we believe that there is some kind of conspiracy, some kind of secret organization working against the party, and that you are involved in it. We want to join it and work for it. We are enemies of the party. Tell us, is there such a person as Goldstein? He said. Yes, there is such a person, and he is alive. Where, I do not know. And the conspiracy, the organization, is it real? It is not simply an invention of the thought police. No, it is real. The Brotherhood, we call it. You will never learn much more about the Brotherhood than that it exists and that you belong to it. I will come back to that presently. You will understand that I must start by asking you certain questions. In general terms, what are you prepared to do? Anything that we are capable of, said Winston. You are prepared to give your lives? Yes. You are prepared to commit murder? Yes, to commit acts of sabotage which may cause the death of hundreds of innocent people. Yes, to betray your country to foreign powers. Yes, you are prepared to do anything which is likely to cause demoralization and weaken the power of the party. Yes, you are prepared to commit suicide if and when we order you to do so. Yes. You are prepared, the two of you, to separate and never see one another again. No, broke in Julia. It appeared to Winston that a long time passed before he answered. No, he said, finally. You did well to tell me, said O'Brien. It is necessary for us to know everything. You understand that you will be fighting in the dark. You will always be in the dark. You will receive orders, and you will obey them without knowing why. Later I shall send you a book from which you will learn the true nature of the society we live in, and the strategy by which we shall destroy it. When you have read the book, you will be full members of the Brotherhood. He halted and looked at his wristwatch. It is almost time for you to leave. There are details to be settled, he said. I assume that you have a hiding place of some kind. Winston explained about the room over Mr. Charrington's shop. Uh, that will do for the moment. Later we will arrange something else for you. It is important to change one's hiding place frequently. Meanwhile, I shall send you a copy of the book. At the door, Winston looked back, but O'Brien seemed already to be in the process of putting him out of mind. He was waiting with his hand on the switch that controlled the telescreen. Within thirty seconds, it occurred to him, O'Brien would be back at his interrupted and important work on behalf of the party. 
Winston was gelatinous with fatigue. Gelatinous was the right word. It had come into his head spontaneously. His body seemed to have not only the weakness of a jelly, but its translucency. He had worked more than ninety hours in five days for hate week. So had everyone else in the ministry. Now it was all over, and he had literally nothing to do, no party work of any description until tomorrow morning. He could spend six hours in the hiding place and another nine in his own bed. Slowly, in mid-afternoon sunshine, he walked up a dingy street in the direction of Mr. Charrington's shop, keeping one eye open for the patrols, but irrationally convinced that this afternoon there was no danger of anyone interfering with him. With a sort of voluptuous creaking in his joints, he climbed the stair about Mr. Charrington's shop. He was tired, but not sleepy any more. He opened the window, lit the dirty little oil stove, and put on a pan of water for coffee. Julia would arrive presently. Meanwhile, there was the book. It was a heavy black volume, amateurishly bound, with no name or title on the cover. The print also looked slightly irregular. The pages were worn at the edges and fell apart, easily, as though the book had passed through many hands. The inscription on the title page ran, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism, by Emmanuel Goldstein. Winston stopped reading, in comfort and safety. He was alone, no telescreen, no ear at the keyhole, no nervous impulse to glance over his shoulder or cover the page with his hand. He settled deeper into the armchair, and put his feet up on the fender. It was bliss. It was eternity. Suddenly, as one sometimes does with a book of which one knows that one will ultimately read and reread every word, he opened it at a different place, and found himself at chapter three. He went on reading. Chapter three. War is peace. The splitting up of the world into three great superstates was an event which could be, and indeed was, foreseen before the middle of the twentieth century. With the absorption of Europe by Russia and of the British Empire by the United States, two of the three existing powers, Eurasia and Oceania, were already effectively in being. The third, East Asia, only emerged as a distinct unit after another decade of confused fighting. The frontiers between the three superstates are in some places arbitrary, and in others they fluctuate according to the fortunes of war, but in general they follow geographical lines. In one combination or another, these three superstates are permanently at war, and have been so for the past twenty-five years. War, however, is no longer the desperate, annihilating struggle that it was in the early decades of the twentieth century. It is a warfare of limited aims, between combatants who are unable to destroy one another, have no material cause for fighting, and are not divided by any genuine ideological difference. War hysteria is continuous and universal in all countries, and such acts as raping, looting, the slaughter of children, the reduction of whole populations to slavery, and reprisals against prisoners which extend even to boiling and burying alive, are looked upon as normal and, when they are committed by one's own side and not by the enemy, meritorious. But in a physical sense, war involves very small numbers of people, mostly highly trained specialists, and causes comparatively few casualties. The fighting, when there is any, takes place on the vague frontiers whose whereabouts the average man can only guess at. The world today is a bare, hungry, dilapidated place compared with the world that existed before 1914, and still more so if compared with the imaginary future to which the people of that period looked forward. Goods must be produced, but they must not be distributed, and in practice the only way of achieving this is by continuous warfare. The essential act of war is destruction, not necessarily of human lives, but of the products of human labor. War is a way of shattering to pieces, or pouring into the stratosphere, or sinking in the depths of the sea, materials which might otherwise be used to make the masses too comfortable, and hence, in the long run, too intelligent. The best books, he perceived, are those that tell you what you know already. 
He had just turned to chapter one when he heard Julia's footstep on the stair and started out of his chair to meet her. She flung herself into his arms. It was more than a week since they had seen one another. I've got the book, he said as they disentangled themselves. Oh, you've got it. Good, she said without much interest and almost immediately knelt down beside the oil stove to make the coffee. They did not return to the subject until they had been in bed for half an hour. The evening was just cool enough to make it worthwhile to pull up the counterpane. Winston reached out for the book which was lying on the floor and sat up against the bedhead. We must read it, he said. You too, all members of the Brotherhood, have to read it. You read it, she said with her eyes shut. Read it aloud. That's the best way. Then you can explain it to me as you go. The clock's hands said six, meaning eighteen. They had three or four hours ahead of them. He propped the book against his knees and began reading. Chapter One Ignorance is Strength Throughout recorded time, and probably since the end of the Neolithic Age, there have been three kinds of people in the world, the high, the middle, and the low. The aims of these three groups are entirely irreconcilable. The aim of the high is to remain where they are. The aim of the middle is to change places with the high. The aim of the low, when they have an aim, for it is an abiding characteristic of the low, that they are too much crushed by drudgery to be more than intermittently conscious of anything outside their daily lives, is to abolish all distinctions and create a society in which all men shall be equal. Thus, throughout history, a struggle which is the same in its main outlines recurs over and over again. Given this background, one could infer, if one did not know it already, the general structure of oceanic society. At the apex of the pyramid comes Big Brother. Big Brother is infallible and all-powerful. Every success, every achievement, every victory, every scientific discovery, all knowledge, all wisdom, all happiness, all virtue, are held to issue directly from his leadership and inspiration. Nobody has ever seen Big Brother. He is a face on the hoardings, a voice on the telescreens. We may be reasonably sure that he will never die, and there is already a considerable uncertainty as to when he was born. Big Brother is the guise in which the party chooses to exhibit itself to the world. His function is to act as a focusing point for love, fear, and reverence, emotions which are more easily felt towards an individual than towards an organization. Below Big Brother comes the inner party, its numbers limited to six millions, or something less than two percent of the population of Oceania. Below the inner party comes the outer party, which, if the inner party is described as the brain of the state, may be justly likened to the hands. Below that come the dumb masses, whom we habitually refer to as the proles, numbering perhaps eighty-five percent of the population. In the terms of our earlier classification, the proles are the low. All the beliefs, habits, tastes, emotions, mental attitudes that characterize our time are really designed to sustain the mystique of the party and prevent the true nature of present-day society from being perceived. A party member lives from birth to death under the eye of the thought police. Even when he is alone, he can never be sure that he is alone. A party member is expected to have no private emotions and no respites from enthusiasm. He is supposed to live in a continuous frenzy of hatred of foreign enemies and internal traitors, triumph over victories and self-abasement before the power and wisdom of the party. The discontents produced by his bare, unsatisfying life are deliberately turned outwards and dissipated by such devices as the two minutes hate. In old speak it is called, quite frankly, reality control. In new speak it is called double think, though double think comprises much else as well. Double think means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. Even the names of the four ministries by which we are governed exhibit a sort of impudence in their deliberate reversal of the facts. The Ministry of Peace concerns itself with war, the Ministry of Truth with lies, the Ministry of Love with torture, and the Ministry of Plenty 
with starvation. These contradictions are not accidental, nor do they result from ordinary hypocrisy. They are deliberate exercises in double think. For it is only by reconciling contradictions that power can be retained indefinitely. In no other way could the ancient cycle be broken. If human equality is to be forever averted, if the high, as we have called them, are to keep their places permanently, then the prevailing mental attitude must be controlled insanity. But there is one question which until this moment we have almost ignored. It is, why should human equality be averted? Supposing that the mechanics of the process have been rightly described, what is the motive for this huge, accurately planned effort to freeze history at a particular moment of time? Here we reach the central secret. As we have seen, the mystique of the party, and above all of the inner party, depends upon double-think. But deeper than this lies the original motive, the never-question instinct that first led to the seizure of power and brought double-think, the thought police, continuous warfare, and all the other necessary paraphernalia into existence afterwards. This motive really consists... Winston stopped reading. If there was hope, it lay in the proles. Without having to read to the end of the book, he knew that that must be Goldstein's final message. The future belonged to the proles. Out of their mighty loins a race of conscious beings must one day come. We are the dead. Theirs is the future. We are the dead, Winston said. We are the dead echoed Julia dutifully. You are the dead, said an iron voice behind them. They sprang apart. Winston's entrails seemed to have turned into ice. He could see the white all round the irises of Julia's eyes. You are the dead, repeated the iron voice. It was behind that picture, breathed Julia. It was behind that picture said the voice. Remain exactly where you are. Make no movement until you are ordered. It was starting. It was starting at last. They could do nothing except stand gazing into one another's eyes. To run for life, to get out of the house before it was too late. No such thought occurred to them. Unthinkable to disobey the iron voice from the wall. There was a snap as though a catch had been turned back and a crash of breaking glass. The picture had fallen to the floor, uncovering the telescreen behind it. Now we can see you, said the voice. Stand out in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. Clasp your hands behind your heads. Do not touch one another. They were not touching, but it seemed to him that he could feel Julia's body shaking, or perhaps it was merely the shaking of his own. Something crashed onto the bed behind Winston's back. The head of a ladder had been thrust through the window and had burst in the frame. Someone was climbing through the window. There was a stampede of boots up the stairs. The room was full of solid men in black uniforms with iron-shod boots on their feet and truncheons in their hands. There was another crash. Someone had picked up the glass paperweight from the table and smashed it to pieces on the hearthstone. One of the men had smashed his fist into Julia's solar plexus, doubling her up like a pocket ruler. She was thrashing about on the floor, fighting for breath. Winston dared not turn his head, even by a millimetre, but sometimes her livid, gasping face came within the angle of his vision. Even in his terror, it was as though he could feel the pain in his own body. Then two of the men hoisted her up by knees and shoulders and carried her out of the room like a sack. Winston had a glimpse of her face upside down and contorted, with the eyes shut, and that was the last he saw of her. He stood dead still. No one had hit him yet. He wondered whether they had got Mr. Charrington. He wondered what they had done to the woman who sang in the yard. He noticed that he badly wanted to urinate and felt a faint surprise because he'd done so only two or three hours ago. 
He noticed that the clock on the mantelpiece said nine, meaning twenty-one. But the light seemed too strong. Would not the light be fading at twenty-one hours on an August evening? He wondered whether, after all, he and Julia had mistaken the time, had slept the clock round and thought it was twenty-thirty, when really it was not eight-thirty on the following morning. But he did not pursue the thought further. It was not interesting. There was another, lighter step in the passage. Mr. Charrington came into the room. The demeanour of the black uniformed men suddenly became more subdued. Something had also changed in Mr. Charrington's appearance. The wrinkles were gone. The whole line of the face seemed to have altered. It was the alert, cold face of a man of about thirty-five. It occurred to Winston that for the first time in his life he was looking, with knowledge, at a member of the Thought Police. He did not know where he was. Presumably he was in the Ministry of Love, but there was no way of making certain. He was in a high-ceilinged, windowless cell with walls of glittering white porcelain. Concealed lamps flooded it with cold light, and there was a low, steady humming sound which he supposed had something to do with the air supply. A bench or shelf, just wide enough to sit on, ran round the wall, broken only by the door, and at the end opposite the door, a lavatory pan with no wooden seat. There were four telescreens, one in each wall. He did not know how long he'd been there, some hours at any rate. With no clocks and no daylight, it was hard to gauge the time. He hardly thought of Julia. He could not fix his mind on her. He loved her and would not betray her. But that was only a fact known as he knew the rules of arithmetic. He felt no love for her, and he hardly even wondered what was happening to her. He thought oftener of O'Brien with a flickering hope. O'Brien must know that he'd been arrested. The Brotherhood, he had said, never tried to save its members. But there was the razor blade. They would send the razor blade if they could. Somewhere or other, Julia was suffering, perhaps far worse than he. She might be screaming with pain at this moment. He thought, if I could save Julia by doubling my own pain, would I do it? Yes, I would. But that was merely an intellectual decision taken because he knew that he ought to take it. He did not feel it. In this place you could not feel anything except pain and foreknowledge of pain. There was the sound of marching boots outside. The steel door opened with a clang. O'Brien came in. Winston started to his feet. The shock of the sight had driven all caution out of him. For the first time in many years he forgot the presence of the telescreen. They've got you too, he cried. They got me a long time ago, said O'Brien, with a mild, almost regretful irony. He stepped aside. From behind him there emerged a broad-chested guard with a long black truncheon in his hand. Winston was lying on something that felt like a camp bed, except that it was higher off the ground, and that he was fixed down in some way so that he could not move. Light that seemed stronger than usual was falling on his face. O'Brien was standing at his side, looking down at him intently. At the other side of him stood a man in a white coat holding a hypodermic syringe. The nightmare had started. How many times he had been beaten, how long the beatings had continued, he could not remember. Always there were five or six men at him simultaneously. Their real weapon was the merciless questioning that went on and on, hour after hour, tripping him up, laying traps for him, twisting everything that he said convicting him at every step of lies and self-contradiction, until he began weeping as much from shame as from nervous fatigue. Sometimes they would suddenly change their tune, call him Comrade, appeal to him in the name of Big Brother, and ask him, sorrowfully, 
whether even now he had not enough loyalty to the party left to make him wish to undo the evil he had done. O'Brien was the tormentor. He was the protector. He was the inquisitor. He was the friend. And once Winston could not remember whether it was in a drugged sleep or in normal sleep, or even in a moment of wakefulness. A voice murmured in his ear, Don't worry, Winston. You are in my keeping. For seven years I have watched over you. Now the turning point has come. I shall save you. I shall make you perfect. There was a period of blackness, and then the cell, or room, in which he now was, had gradually materialized around him. He was almost flat on his back and unable to move. His body was strapped down at every essential point. O'Brien was looking down at him gravely and rather sadly. Under his hand there was a dial with a lever on top and figures running round the face. Without any warning except a slight movement of O'Brien's hand, a wave of pain flooded his body. It was a frightening pain. His body was being wrenched out of shape. The joints were being slowly torn apart. O'Brien drew back the lever on the dial. The wave of pain receded almost as quickly as it had come. That was forty, said O'Brien. You can see that the numbers on this dial run up to a hundred. Will you please remember throughout our conversation that I have it in my power to inflict pain on you at any moment and to whatever degree I choose? If you tell me any lies, or attempt to prevaricate in any way, or even fall below your usual level of intelligence, you will cry out with pain, instantly. Do you understand that? Yes, said Winston. I am taking trouble with you, Winston, he said, because you are worth trouble. You know perfectly well what is the matter with you. You have known it for years though you have fought against the knowledge. You are mentally deranged. You suffer from a defective memory. You are unable to remember real events, and you persuade yourself that you remember other events which never happened. Fortunately, it is curable. You have never cured yourself of it because you did not choose to. There was a small effort of the will that you were not ready to make. Even now, I am well aware... You are clinging to your disease under the impression that it is a virtue. Do you remember writing in your diary, Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four? Yes, said Winston. O'Brien held up his left hand, its back towards Winston, with the thumb hidden and the four fingers extended. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says that it is not four, but five, then how many? Four. The needle went up to sixty. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Four. What else can I say? Four. The needle must have risen again, but he did not look at it. The heavy stern faces and the four fingers filled his vision. The fingers stood up before his eyes like pillars, enormous, blurry, and seeming to vibrate, but unmistakably four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Stop it! Stop it! How can you go on? Four! Four! How many fingers, Winston? Five! 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 No, Winston, that is no use. You are lying. You still think there are four. How many fingers, please? F four! Five! Four! Anything you like, only stop it! Stop the pain! The pain lessened again. He opened his eyes. 
O'Brien had drawn back the lever. How many fingers, Winston? Four. I suppose there are four. I would see five if I could. I'm trying to see five. Which do you wish? To persuade me that you see five, or really to see them? Really to see them? Again, said O'Brien. Perhaps the needle was eighty, ninety. Winston could not intermittently remember why the pain was happening. Behind his screwed-up eyelids, a forest of fingers seemed to be moving in a sort of dance, weaving in and out, disappearing behind one another and reappearing again. He was trying to count them. He could not remember why. He knew only that it was impossible to count them, and that this was somehow due to the mysterious identity between five and four. The pain died again. When he opened his eyes, it was to find that he was still seeing the same thing. Innumerable fingers, like moving trees, were still streaming past in either direction, crossing and recrossing. He shut his eyes again. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? I don't know. I don't know. You will kill me if you do that again. Four, five, six. I, in all honesty, I don't know. Better, said O'Brien. A needle slid into Winston's arm. Almost in the same instant, a blissful, healing warmth spread all through his body. The pain was already half forgotten. He opened his eyes and looked up gratefully at O'Brien. O'Brien leant over Winston's face. "'You are thinking,' he said, "'that since we intend to destroy you utterly, "'that nothing that you say or do can make the smallest difference. "'In that case, why do we go to the trouble of interrogating you first? "'That is what you were thinking, was it not?' "'Yes,' said Winston. O'Brien smiled slightly. You are a flaw in the pattern, Winston. You are a stain that must be wiped out. We are different from the persecutors of the past. We are not content with negative obedience, nor even with the most abject submission. When finally you surrender to us, it must be of your own free will. We do not destroy the heretic because he resists us. So long as he resists us, we never destroy him. We convert him. We capture his inner mind. We reshape him. We make him one of ourselves before we kill him. Everyone is washed clean. His voice had grown almost dreamy. Do not imagine that you will save yourself, Winston, however completely you surrender to us. We shall squeeze you empty, and then we shall fill you with ourselves. O'Brien stood up with a satisfied air. Over to his left, Winston saw the man in the white coat break an ampule and draw back the plunger of a syringe. O'Brien turned to Winston with a smile. I enjoy talking to you. Your mind appeals to me. It resembles my own mind, except that you happen to be insane. Before we bring the session to an end, you can ask me a few questions, if you choose. Any question I like? Anything. He saw that Winston's eyes were upon the dial. It is switched off. What is your first question? What have you done with Julia? said Winston. O'Brien smiled again. She betrayed you, Winston. Immediately, unreservedly. I have seldom seen anyone come over to us so promptly. You would hardly recognize her if you saw her. All her rebelliousness has been burned out of her. It was a perfect conversion, a textbook case. You tortured her? O'Brien left this unanswered. Next question, he said. 
Does Big Brother exist? Of course he exists. The party exists. Big Brother is the embodiment of the party. Does he exist in the same way as I exist? You do not exist, said O'Brien. Does the Brotherhood exist? That, Winston, you will never know. If we choose to set you free when we have finished with you, and if you live to be ninety years old, still you will never learn whether the answer to that question is yes or no. As long as you live, it will be an unsolved riddle in your mind. But you've read Goldstein's book, said Winston. I wrote it. That is to say, I collaborated in writing it. Is it true what he says? A description, yes. Tell me, how soon will they shoot me? It might be a long time, said O'Brien. You are a difficult case, but don't give up hope. Everyone is cured sooner or later. In the end, we shall shoot you. But before that, you must be cured. Intellectually, there is very little wrong with you. It is only emotionally that you have failed to make progress. Tell me, Winston, and remember, no lies. You know that I am always able to detect a lie. Tell me, what are your true feelings towards Big Brother? I hate him. You hate him? Good. Then the time has come for you to take the last step. You must love Big Brother. It is not enough to obey him. You must love him. He released Winston with a little push towards the guards. Room 101, he said. The next cell was bigger than most he had been in, but he hardly noticed his surroundings. All he noticed was that there were two small tables straight in front of him, each covered with green bays. One was only a meter or two from him, the other was further away near the door. He was strapped upright in a chair, so tightly that he could move nothing, not even his head. For a moment he was alone, then the door opened and O'Brien came in. You have asked me, said O'Brien, what is in room 101? You know the answer already. The thing that is in room 101 is the worst thing in the world. The door opened again. A guard came in, carrying something made of wire, a box or basket of some kind. He set it down on the further table. Because of the position in which O'Brien was standing, Winston could not see what the thing was. The worst thing in the world, said O'Brien, varies from individual to individual. It may be burial alive, or death by fire, or by drowning, or by impalement, or fifty other deaths. There are cases where it is some quite trivial thing, not even fatal. He had moved a little to one side, so that Winston had a better view of the thing on the table. It was an oblong wire cage, with a handle on top for carrying it by. Fixed to the front of it was something that looked like a fencing mask with a concave side outwards. Although it was three or four metres away from him, he could see that the cage was divided lengthways into two compartments, and that there was some kind of creature in each. "'In your case,' said O'Brien, "'the worst thing in the world happens to be rat. A sort of premonitory tremor, a fear of what he was not certain, had passed through Winston as soon as he caught his first glimpse of the cage. But at this moment the meaning of the mask-like attachment in front of it suddenly sank into him. His bowels seemed to turn to water. <sighs> you can't do that! he cried out in a high, cracked voice. You couldn't! You couldn't! It's impossible! O'Brien picked up the cage, and as he did so, pressed something in it. There was a sharp click. 
Winston made a frantic effort to tear himself loose from the chair. It was hopeless. Every part of him, even his head, was held immovably. O'Brien moved the cage nearer. It was less than a meter from Winston's face. "'I have pressed the first lever,' said O'Brien. "'You understand the construction of this cage? The mask will fit over your head, leaving no exit. When I press this other lever, the door of the cage will slide up. These starving brutes will shoot out of it like bullets.' The cage was nearer. It was closing in. To think, to think even with a split second left, to think was the only hope. Suddenly the foul, musty odour of the brutes struck his nostrils. There was a violent convulsion of nausea inside him, and he almost lost consciousness. Suddenly he was shouting frantically over and over, "'Do it to Julia! Do it to Julia! Not me! Julia!' I don't care what you do to her! Tear her face off! Strip her of the bones! Not me! Julia! Not me! There was the cold touch of wire against his cheek. But through the darkness that enveloped him he heard another metallic click and knew that the cage door had clicked shut and not open. The café was almost empty. A ray of sunlight slanting through a window fell on dusty tabletops. It was the lonely hour of fifteen. A tinny music trickled from the telescreens. Winston sat in his usual corner, gazing into an empty glass. Now and again he glanced up at a vast face which eyed him from the opposite wall. "'Big Brother is watching you,' the caption said. Unbidden, a waiter came and filled his glass up with victory gin, shaking into it a few drops from another bottle with a quill through the cork. It was saccharin, flavoured with cloves, the speciality of the café. Winston was listening to the telescreen. There was a possibility that at any moment there might be a special bulletin from the Ministry of Peace. The news from the African front was disquieting in the extreme. On and off he had been worrying about it all day. Julia had said, They can't get inside you. But they could get inside you. What happens to you here is forever, O'Brien had said. That was the true word. There were things, your own acts, from which you could never recover. Something was killed in your breast, burnt out, cauterized out. He had seen her. He had even spoken to her. There was no danger in it. He knew as though instinctively that they now took almost no interest in his doings. He could have arranged to meet her a second time if either of them had wanted to. Neither did. A shrill trumpet call had pierced the air. It was the bulletin. Victory! It always meant victory when a trumpet call preceded the news. A sort of electric thrill ran through the café. Even the waiters had started and pricked up their ears. Under the table Winston's feet made convulsive movements. He had not stirred from his seat, but in his mind he was running, swiftly running. He was with the crowds outside, cheering himself deaf. He looked up again at the portrait of Big Brother. The colossus that bestrode the world, the rock against which the halls of Asia dash themselves in vain. Ah, and it was more than a Eurasian army that had perished. Much had changed in him since that first day in the Ministry of Love, but the final, indispensable, healing change had never happened until this moment. Winston? sitting in a blissful dream, paid no attention as his glass was filled up. He was not running or cheering any longer. He was back in the ministry of love, with everything forgiven, his soul white as snow. He was in the public dock, confessing everything, implicating everybody. He was walking down the white-tiled corridor with a feeling of walking in sunlight, and an armed guard at his back. The long-hoped-for bullet was entering his brain. 
He gazed up at the enormous face. Forty years it had taken him to learn what kind of smile was hidden beneath the dark moustache. Oh, cruel, needless misunderstanding! Oh, stubborn, self-willed exile from the loving breast! Two gin-scented tears trickled down the sides of his nose. But it was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. <laughs>